Hello. A very good afternoon to our honoured guest, Professor Dato Adiba Kamaruzaman, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Professor Sanjeev Mahadewa, Head of Department of Medicine, Professor Dato and Datin Tan Chong Tin, Senior Consultant Neurologist, Neurology Unit, our distinguished invited speakers, Professor John Walter Dunn, University of Western Australia, Professor Lim Shi Hui, Duke and Duke NUS Medical School and National Neuroscience Institute, Singapore General Hospital, leading members of the Neuroscience Fraternity. We are very happy to see each of you making the way here today. Respected colleagues and friends, on behalf of the Neurology Unit and the Department of Medicine, we would like to sincerely thank all of you for coming to join us in this special and momentous event, the Fashri Symposium for Professor Dato Dr. Tan Chong Tin. I am Ai Hui, a neurologist and a proud member of the Neurology Unit in University of Malaya. It is an honor to emcee this special occasion and with great pleasure, I would like to call upon our Head of Neurology Unit, Professor Goh Kian Jin, to give his welcoming speech. Welcome, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I think the word festschrift comes from German. And in its original meaning, fest means celebration and schrift means writings. So in actual fact, the meaning of festschrift is a collection of writings in the honour of a scholar. So we are here today to honour a distinguished and uh, the achievements and contributions of such a person, Professor C.T. Tan. Professor C.T. Tan, of course, is an internationally renowned neurologist and academic. His contributions to the fields of neurology are many and varied, and his name is, in fact, synonymous with Asian neurology. However, we take Professor Tan as our own, and we honour him for his many contributions in medicine to neurology uh, in this country, Malaysia. And of course, especially in this particular institution, the University of Malaya. So Professor Tan is probably one of the few who have witnessed the transformation of our institution from this to this and the growth of which, in no small part, he personally contributed. So this afternoon, we celebrate a true icon of the university. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Go. Now, with great honour, we would like to call upon our Head of Department of Medicine, Professor Sanjeev Mahadeva, to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you, Madam MC, uh, Dr. Tan Ai Hui. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to welcome all of you, and hopefully a few more who will be trickling in later on this afternoon to this celebrated event, uh, the uh, Fresh Script Symposium for Dato Professor Tan Chong Ting. I'd like to start off my uh, welcome speech in the usual manner to our respected guests. First and foremost, uh, the Dean, Professor uh, Dato Adiba Kamaruzaman of uh, Faculty of Medicine, all uh, heads uh, and senior staff from various departments in uh, University of Malaya Medical Center and Faculty of Medicine. I'm very, very happy to see uh, some of you here today. Uh, the heads of units in the Department of Medicine. The medicine department has grown so much now that we welcome all the heads 
uh, when they attend such a meeting like this, organized by the Department of Medicine. And of course, uh, the invited faculty uh, and friends of Professor Tan Chong Ting, uh, Professor John Dunn from University of Western Australia, and Professor Lim Shi Hui from uh, Singapore General Hospital and Duke and US Medical School. In addition, uh, I'd like to welcome the senior neurologists who have uh, made the time and effort to attend here from the Ministry of Health and uh, from the private sector from all parts of Malaysia. Not forgetting the junior physicians who have all uh, come here today from the Department of Medicine, all brimming with enthusiasm uh, and potential budding uh, neurologists of the future. Uh, also, uh, there are some medical students uh, from uh, the Faculty of Medicine who are also interested in this field, nurses from the University of Malaya Medical Center, and last but not least, the technical and allied health staff from the Neurology Lab at UMMC. Uh, welcome everyone to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, the Department of Medicine has had a long and proud tradition with the University of Malaya since its inception. The first dean uh, was a physician himself, and it is currently the largest and the most academically successful department in the Faculty of Medicine. It is also the largest department in University of Malaya Medical Center, providing more than one third of the services that we have on a daily basis. Most of this in medicine is at a tertiary level subspecialty service. And as a result of that, we are also one of the largest medical subspecialty training centers in Malaysia. Now, all of which I've said today, all these achievements are in no small way, no small way due to the vision and dedication of seniors like Professor Tan Chong Tin, who has developed neurology in University of Malaya to what it is today. Professor Tan, or Professor Siti Tan, as he is um, famously known as, has successfully headed the neurology unit in the Department of Medicine for almost 25 years. His leadership in research and in training and interest in advocacy has brought much national and international recognition to the neurology unit, the Department of Medicine, and the Faculty of Medicine at University of Malaya. I'm sure this afternoon we will hear more about this and I will not elaborate any further. So ladies and gentlemen, today, the Department of Medicine is proud to celebrate Professor Tan's work and his passion in the field of neurology. But more importantly, I hope that the young juniors and, and students in the audience will be taking away some important lessons and tips to inspire them to become as great as Professor Tan Chong Ting in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sanjeev. Now, with great pleasure, we would like to call upon our Dean from Faculty of Medicine, Professor Adiba, to deliver her speech. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Prof Tan and, and Datin Tan, um, Professor John Dan and Professor Lim Shihui, our um, invited guests for this afternoon, um, heads of departments and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me relate my personal experience with Prof Dan um, to that especially come to mind. When I first joined um, 
UM, UMMC 1997, yeah, a long time ago. I, uh, in, in those days, the uh, Manara Utama, they had a little, um, on the seventh floor, there was a little doctor's uh, room where we could go and, you know, have a cup of tea, read the papers, and being new at the time, I used to go and hide there in the first few weeks of uh, my joining UM. And there would be this um, senior professor already at the time, Prof Tang was already a senior professor who would be sitting there having his lunch, uh, which I think was always very uh, meager lunch, and uh, reading the papers. I think after about a week or so, I finally gathered the courage to say, um, uh, hello, I'm, <laughs> I'm Adiba, I'm new to the uh, Department of Medicine. Um, you know, I'm an infectious diseases physician. And this gentleman looked up and said, I'm Prof Tan, I know who you are, I interviewed you. <laughs> I felt so embarrassed, uh, but that was how we met uh, for the second time. And then, of course, I had the uh, opportunity to work uh, with Prof Tan very, very closely during the Nipah outbreak. And uh, during that time, uh, I think I saw and learned um, what it meant to be a, a leader um, and, and, and someone who um, was completely uh, dedicated and compassionate um, uh, to the, 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 the every individual patient's needs. Um, we were, if you recall, some of you who lived through that outbreak, um, were going through uh, pretty unprecedented um, uh, event uh, in, in, a, in the life of a, of a doctor, of a physician. I was actually pregnant at the time. And every day I went home, you know, we were faced with this this disease where people were literally, uh, you know, dying in front of our eyes. And um, so every time, every day I went home, I was describing this to my husband and he would say, you know, it's not too late to be a cardiologist. <laughs> because I, I was telling him, look, we've got all these people with this disease. We have no idea what it's due to. Um, I have no idea whether, you know, we could all be infected from it or not. Um, my husband, who's not a doctor, said, I told you cardiology or gastro was the way to go. <laughs> but anyway, Prof Tan, you know, held us all together, uh, made sure that um, we were, you know, practicing uh, medicine at the highest level, trying to discover um, what it was that uh, was, was killing all these patients. And um, one day we went to a meeting with the Minister of Health at the time, and Prof Tan was convinced that it wasn't Japanese encephalitis. And he had to, um, had to convince the Ministry of Health, um, colleagues in, in this faculty. And, and this was before we discovered the virus. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of, of discussion and toing and froing. And, um, and I remember Prof Tan uh, not arguing, but uh, convincing the Minister of Health. Um, that we had to kill the pigs after we discovered the, the virus, we, the royal we, after uh, Chua Kao Bing uh, and team discovered the virus on Prof Tan's insistence that this was not Japanese encephalitis, that this was another disease that, that what we were seeing, you know, this, this is a mark of a true clinician uh, and a true, um, uh, yeah, a true, a true great clinician that he was convinced this was not Japanese encephalitis because it didn't fit the picture of Japanese encephalitis and pursued that and pursued that until um, uh, Prof Chua discovered the virus and then also pursued um, and, and, and went and convinced the Minister of Health that unless we shoot those pigs, we will not bring the virus under control. Um, and, and I was there to witness this, how he made this convincing argument uh, with the minister saying, but this is a $2 billion industry, we're going to decimate um, the industry. And Prof Tan held his ground and said, you have to kill the pigs. And killed the pig we did, pigs we did, and uh, which, as you all know, brought the... Um, uh, the, the, the epidemic and outbreak under control. And I think, you know, 
in, in one sense, although I had my husband saying, you know, give up infectious diseases, become a cardiologist. Um, but it was through having uh, the opportunity to work with with Prof Tan, even though we were all, you know, in, in a sense, thought we, we were putting ourselves at risk, um, you know, that, that kind of convinced me that um, we were all doing the right thing, um, having watched him in action, um, in a sense, without over-dramatizing it, um, saving the nation, because uh, for those of you who were involved in, in the Nipah outbreak, we were literally seeing people, you know, dying in front of our very eyes. As uh, Sanjeev alluded to, that wasn't the only claim to fame for Prof Tan. I think, um, you know, for any faculty, for any institution, um, the, it's, it's the, the human capital. It's having um, someone uh, like Professor Tan is what makes uh, our faculty, what makes our department. I'm proudly a member of the Department of Medicine, as you know. Um, and with the competition that the faculty and, and the university faces, uh, you know, the, the medical school faces with uh, and the, the privatization of healthcare and the privatization of education in this country, we were losing and we still lose uh, a lot of senior and experienced people. But we are very fortunate to have someone like Prof Tan uh, with us that anchors the faculty you know, brings it prestige and uh, have people from all over the world wanting to train with him and with other colleagues in, um, in the Faculty of Medicine. So I wake up every morning thanking my lucky stars that I have, um, you know, these big names like Prof Tan and others to continue to uh, raise the flag of uh, Faculty of Medicine. As uh, Sanjeev alluded to, um, not only has Prof Tan not only is Prof Tan synonymous with uh, Asian neurology and um, has really shaped what neurology is today in Malaysia, but he's also been instrumental in, um, in attracting trainees from uh, countries around the region, from Myanmar, from um, Maldives and, and other places. Um, we, all of us, many of us in the room have gained um, uh, knowledge and experience from going overseas, going to Australia, going to the UK. And I, and I, and I think Prof Tan, like I believe that now it's our turn to um, train uh, colleagues from around the region to, to uplift the standards of uh, health in countries around us. So that and many, many other contributions Prof Tan has made to medicine and in particular to neurology, I think is a reason we're here to celebrate uh, you know, an eminent uh, physician, scientist, um, and educator. And uh, with that, I once again thank all of you for coming this afternoon to share in this celebration with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adiba, for those heartfelt sharings. Um, so next, uh, we would like to introduce our next speaker who will be giving the first lecture for this symposium. Professor John Dunn is a professor at the Departments of Medicine and Surgery, University of Western Australia. He is the chairman of the Western Australian Epilepsy and Adult Clinical Neurology Service, Neurophysiology Services. As the chairman of the Asian Epilepsy Academy International League Against Epilepsy, he is a leading clinical neurologist and neurophysiologist who is actively involved in epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology training in Australia and also throughout the Asian and Oceanian region. Professor John Dunn will be delivering a lecture on intraoperative neurophysiologic monitoring keeping patients safe. Please put your hands together for Professor John Dan. So, um, I'm going to be using my own, own computer, which is always a challenge. And while I'm setting it up, I'll have to say to you that I feel very fortunate to be here today at the University of Malaya, because I'm surrounded by you, wonderful people who are contributing so much to the community, 
whether it be in education, research or clinical care. And so I feel very fortunate. And I also feel very fortunate that many years ago, I met our colleague, Professor Tan Chong Tin. And once I get my computer going, I'm going to have to st start my talk by giving some family photographs. Now, well, that's encouraging. I can see that some kind of screen is appearing. And, um, and yes, that's my presentation. And let's go for it. Bingo. And there is the University of Malaya, which I'm very happy to be at. And here is <coughs> Professor Tan Chong Tin, seen here in 2007 with Lim Shi Wee. They're handsome guys. <laughs> Over the many years that I've known Chong Tin, he has led me to countless places, sometimes on foot, We've walked very far, sometimes by boat, even on horseback. <laughs> yes, that's Chong Tin with the arrow pointing to him. He's taken me to numerous medical centres and clinics throughout our region and into many countries. We've walked in open fields. We've walked into the desert. We've walked into places of extreme cold ice and snow. Yes, and that's Chong Tin with the arrow pointed to him. <laughs> We've walked in the jungles. And here's Chong Tin looking particularly stylish with his botanical hat on. We've crossed bridges, even unsteady ones. We've climbed up mountains. And we've even been up into the clouds. And yes, that's Chong Tin who led me up this mountain in, into the mists. Now, I have followed Prof Tan without question. Like Lim Shi Wee and uh, Irene, his wonderful wife seen here on the left, and so mon many of us. Why have I followed him without question? The reason is because we teach together and we serve the community of which we are a part of. The whole world flows when people work together. And we, of course, are a community of friends. And I've learnt so much from Chong Tin. In life, we are sometimes blessed to meet a special person who inspires us. <laughs> Professor Tan is an inspirational leader with a very generous heart. He has a passion to teach, as so many of us know, and a tireless capacity to give to others that shames me at least. And he is a great ambassador, not only for the University of Malaya, but for Malaysia itself in his contributions. But I have to say, nobody is perfect, not even Prof Tan. And here are a couple of shots of us having various meals. And because I trust him so much, he takes advantage of this all of the time at the dinner table by making up the ingredients of what we're eating to shock me. Horse, dog, I don't know what. And he continues to do this, and I continue to believe him. It's one of those things that I have to bear. So now what about intraoperative monitoring? Now for this story, we need to have a beginning. Monitoring nervous system fun function during surgery. The first question we need to ask ourselves is why? And the answer is simple. We want to make surgery safer and more effective. And we can provide a little bit like to a pilot, a navigator. We can navigate where lesions may be and functional regions are. And in the process of surgery, we can monitor neural function to, present, to prevent damage occurring or at least alert the surgeon as to when damage has occurred. Now, in order to do this, monitoring needs to not only be safe and effective, but
but give the surgeons rapid and reliable feedback. And this means a very experienced and well-trained team of technical, medical and other staff. And very careful pre preparation before we get to the operating theatre and attention to many details. And we don't want to interfere with the surgery. And by analogy, I regard myself as a part of the road crew of a concert setting up for a rock band. You need to get the circuits going, you need to get the PowerPoints working, you need to make sure the sound system is working. And that support crew in the operating theatre includes my dear friends the anaesthetists and the neuromonitoring team itself. And here I am with my mask on, plus Ron and my technician Robert. And you can see, I'm not a big man. This comes in very handy in the operating theatre because I'm crawling under the table all of the time, checking cables, checking that systems are working, just like at a rock concert. And we're dealing with a very hostile environment in the operating theatre. There are many machines that create noise that makes us difficult to monitor neurofunction. For example, some of our most hostile neighbours, the blood warmer on the left and the calf pump, um, which prevents DVT on the right. We have to troubleshoot in this hostile environment. And we need to set up everything and obtain intraoperative baselines before the star of the show, that is the surgeon, drapes the patient. Because once the patient is draped, we have virtually no access to the patient. So we have to make sure that everything is working. And by the way, this is something that plays out. I spend two or three days a week in the operating theatres with the various surgeons. Now we're going to go thing, through the things that we might be able to monitor. Well, what about during epilepsy and brain surgery? Well, electrocorticography happens to be the most ancient form of neural monitoring. And here's a picture of Herbert Jasper, seen on the top left, doing EEG monitoring for Wilder Penfield um, back in 1954. So we're not talking about new technology, old technology. And in electrocorticography, what we do is place onto the surface of the brain electrodes that are going to record direct, directly brainwave activity. And this activity, if it's epileptic activity, can guide surgery and define the limits of a resection. And here, for example, is somebody having the left temporal lobe epilepsy surgery. We place strips on the uh, surface of the temporal pole. And here, for those of you who are brainwave um, aficionados, there are spikes and polyspikes coming from the inferomesial temporal region, an area that we will need to target to remove. And even, I might add, in mesial temporal sclerosis, the commonest temporal lobe epilepsy surgery, in our own experience at home in Western Australia, if we see spikes that we can then, with tailored resection re removed, long-term follow-up, we have about 85% of people being seizure-free, whereas if there are residual spikes, our success rate is diminished by about 20%. Now, reading brain waves in the operating theatre is not for the faint-hearted. You need to be considerable training and skill. Artefacts are very common. Various anaesthetics influence the brain wave activity and can distort what you're seeing. And most importantly, after pre-resection recording, post-resection, you may have injury potentials rather than residual spikes from the focus, and chasing those injury potentials can produce patient harm by removing too much brain. So it's not for the faint-hearted. The other limitation of putting strips of electrodes on the surface of the brain is that we're not seeing deeper structures. And in one particular deep structure, here at the bottom of this sulcus is a bottom of the sulcus dysplasia, Bottom of the sulcus dysplasia, if you put a surface strip on, you will not see spikes. However, if you put a depth electrode to the bottom of the sulcus, you see repetitive spiking. And so here's a situation where imaging guides us preeminently rather than electrocorticography. So epilepsy surgery, yes, monitoring is important. 
Now, what about other brainwave surgery? Now, if you open up an anatomy book, it's so easy to understand the different regions of the brain because they are coloured. Here's the speech area, here's the motor area, here's the sensory area. It's all so easy. But what does the real brain look like? <laughs> For goodness sake, where am I? It's just crazy paving. And so in a situation where you have brain tumours, where the structural and functional anatomy of the brain is distorted, where are we? You can see these two large right-sided tumours. Now, on the opposite side of the brain... The arrow I'm pointing to the hand area of the motor strip and just behind is the motor cortex, uh, is, sorry, the central sulcus and then the sensory cortex. Where is it in these tumours? We don't know. This is where neural mapping can be very helpful. And the removal of tumours and brain lesions in general creates the Goldilocks dilemma for the surgeon. You don't want to remove too little you don't want to remove too much. You just want to remove just the right amount. Removing too much, you harm the patient. Removing too little with tumours, a poorer prognosis. Now, the neurosurgeons, of course, have stealth navigation systems where they co-register MRI in the operating theatre and now intraoperative CT and MRI. But the problem with these modalities is they do not measure function. And this is where we can help. Can we map the primary sensory area of the brain, the postcentral gyrus? You bet we can. We can stimulate the median nerve electrically at the wrist, which sends a signal up the arm, the spinal cord, and to the sensory cortex. We can lay a strip over the surface of the brain where we think the central sulcus might be and the sensory cortex. Over the sensory cortex, is a big negative polarity at 20 milliseconds. And then there's the central sulcus. And then front in the motor cortex is a positive polarity, the P20. This isn't a phase reversal. It's a true polarity reversal. And so by if we, at the, if we put the strip at the right angle across what we think is the central sulcus, we can map these areas to pick up where the sensory cortex is. And here's a patient of mine. And you can see. We've just measured 12 stimuli, shock, 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 12. And then we can see these beautiful potentials emerging. This is the back end of the strip over the posterior cortex. This is the anterior head uh, heading to the front. We have this negative potential over the sensory cortex and the positive potential over the motor cortex. So I can tell the surgeon, yes, the central sulcus is here. This is very valuable. Now, what about the motor area, the premotor cortex, the motor cortex? Well, I can give the surgeon a handheld prong and he can stimulate the brain directly in order to record motor potentials. And remember, the patient is draped. I can stick little needles into facial and multiple limb electrodes. The surgeon stimulates the cortex and I can measure where he is. Yes, that is the hand area. Yes, that is the arm area. And we can map the cortex. Now, by stimulating the brain electrically, it is possible to generate seizures. And so, and I kid you not, uh, we can sometimes evoke a seizure. You can tell the seizure's happening because the blood vessels of the pia start to congest and light up even before the electrical seizure discharge, and the surgeons have cold water, cold saline, and pour it onto the brain and it'll switch a seizure off. And so during motor evoked potential mapping, we have cold saline at the ready to stop seizures if we trigger them. Now back to those two patients with these techniques, mapping of the sensory and the motor cortices, we found that this patient, the central sulcus was here. In the other patient, it was behind the tumour. This knowledge protects patients' elegant areas of brain during the removal of the tumour. And in the same way, with deep tumours, we can help out as well. Now, we can't record directly over the tumour, but over the scalp, we can deploy corkscrew electrodes, these tiny little corkscrews that go into the scalp, and we can measure sensory 
potentials and do motor stimulation transcranially through the skull. So before these kind of patients, we put an array of electrodes into the scalp. This array of electrodes is on the patient's scalp. We put them in as the patient is ready to have the craniotomy. And from those electrodes, we can, if we stimulate the median nerve, we can measure the median somatosensory evoked potential. If we stimulate the tibial nerve on the appropriate side, we can measure the tibial somatosensory evoked potential. And if we produce a stimulus into these scalp corkscrew electrodes, enough current can penetrate the skull to stimulate the motor cortex. And here is a video, I hope, that'll work. Okay. Watch his arm. This is... Yeah. Boom. Okay. This is us stimulating his motor cortex yeah. through the skull okay. as, the, as the surgeon is draping. Yeah. Now, during the surgery, as the person is operating on a deep yeah. tumour, we are measuring these motor evoked potentials of limb muscles and we can alert the surgeon and the surgeon, of course, his stealth imaging has allowed him to find where the tumour is, but that doesn't tell him whether he's damaging function or not. Our repetitive testing of motor evoked potentials will protect the patient from having unnecessary loss of function. In the same way, if we have tumours or surgery near language areas, we can map language. This is a little bit more crude. What happens is we do a craniotomy, wake the patient up. During wake craniotomy, the handheld stimulator, the surgeon, stimulates cortex that he thinks might be the speech area. And the awake patient, we're showing a PowerPoint video, a PowerPoint slide showing cat television and asking the patient to name these objects. And if we stimulate an area related to motor function, a speech arrest can occur. This is a little bit more brutal and less elegant than sensory and motor mapping, but very helpful. <coughs> now let's go to the posterior fossa, my favourite area to monitor. We, can we monitor hearing? You bet. We have a little clicker box that through a hollow tube goes to the hollow centre of an earplug covered in gold foil. We can stimulate the ear with this clicking sound. The gold foil in the external ear canal can actually pick up uh, brainstem auditory evoked potential when referenced to CZ. And so this is the recording wire. And so for monitoring hearing, we put our clicker box and ear plug into the ear and we can monitor brainstem auditory evoked potentials. Here a right acoustic neuroma. Here is the left side not being operated on. The multiple waveforms remain normal throughout the procedure. The right side being operated on, not quite normal to begin with. Ultimately, a loss of all waveforms, and the surgeon, every step of the way, in this case, has uh, discovered what he's done to damage the acoustic nerve, but many other times we can preserve hearing. Facial spasm is another area which is a critical one that we can help the surgeons not only protect hearing, because as they retract the cerebellum to look at the facial nerve, it can damage hearing, but to make surgery more effective. What we do is this. We put needle electrodes into the forehead and eye muscles. We put needle electrodes into the chin. We then stimulate the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve. This sends a signal up the nerve to make the eye twitch. Nerves travel quite happily action potentials in both directions. So at the same time as stimulating the nerve and a signal going out to the eye muscle, another signal is going upstream towards the, the, the uh, nerve nucleus. This normally doesn't do anything, but with the short circuit of hemifacial spasm, what happens is this upgoing signal reaches the area of short circuit, jumps tracks, comes down and inappropriately get a chin twitch called the lateral spread response. And here's the theatre set up to do this response. I've got the eye muscle needles in, the chin needles in, another couple of needles to stimulate the zygomatic branch which is going to the eye and by the way in the same way I can stimulate the mandibular branch of the facial nerve to get a lateral spread response in the other direction. 
And here is the facial nerve. And here is a blood vessel wrapped around it, causing the short circuit. And here's what the short circuit looks like. I'm stimulating the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve. I'm getting the expected eye twitch. Shortly thereafter, the unexpected and inappropriate chin twitch, the lateral spread response. Then what happens is the surgeon cleverly and gently peels away the blood vessel and then in between the blood vessel and the nerve puts some Teflon wool to insulate the nerve against the offending blood vessel. And if he does it right, that lateral spread response disappears and this predicts successful surgery. And so with measuring of the lateral spread responses, not only do we, do we make surgery more effective, but also much uh, we, the surgeon knows they're going to be effective or knows they're going to fail before the patient wakes up. And we also measure brainstem function. Now, what about spinal surgery? Spinal surgery, I spend at least one day a week with the surgeons. And we all know that healthy young people, particularly healthy young girls, can have idiopathic scoliosis with quite deforming curves that need to be corrected. And um, there are long-term issues with back pain if people with uh, uh, severe scoliosis don't have corrected surgery. And the result can be spectacular uh, in every way. However, the bad news is that healthy young girl, if she becomes paraplegic, having walked into the uh, hospital, it's an absolute disaster. And this is the most scary part of spinal surgery and the surgeons. Am I going to make this patient paraplegic? And this is what happens during scoliosis surgery. It's a bloody business. It took me a while to get used to it, actually. Um, but what they do is they put various hooks in different areas along where they're going to put the rods, and the rods stretch and rotate the, uh, the cord and spinal column, and that can damage spinal cord function. So we need to keep that spinal cord safe and alert the surgeon to something that's going wrong. We do this at least once a week. We other, do other surgeries too where the spinal cord is at risk. And I thought I'd show you this one, which is the last patient I monitored just between Christmas and New Year. Some of you who understand spinal anatomy may notice it. For God's sake, what's happening here? This is a 14-year-old boy. He has a clipophile congenital abnormality of his upper cervical vertebrae, which are critically squashing his cervicomedullary junction. Really scary. And in fact, I saw him just a couple of weeks ago before the surgery, and he'd been told by the surgeon to stop playing basketball <laughs> for very good reason, for goodness sake. What did the surgeons do? Transorally, they went in and removed the upper cervical bodies, basically destabilising the... And then in a second stage procedure, which you did just before the new year, then putting in a, a plate onto the skull and then to so fixate so his cord's not just floating in the breeze. Now, during both of these stages of the procedure, we need to keep the, the patient safe by reassuring the surgeon that, yes, the patient's still OK. And how do we do this? With the same techniques that I've already described, motor and sensory monitoring. And this makes surgery much, much safer and the surgeons can feel less anxious about what they're doing as they say, is everything going okay, John? Yep. Oh, good. I'll carry on. Get on with the business that I'm trained to do. For uh, t uh, uh, scoliosis surgery, we stimulate the tibial nerves. Those nerves send a signal that's heading up past the um, popliteal fossa then up the spinal cord, we put multiple monitors in to measure the signal as it passes the cervical spine. A needle put onto the cervical lamina. Ear electrodes, nasopharyngeal and esophageal electrodes. And then finally, on the journey from the foot right up to the scalp, multiple scalp electrodes. And all of this somatosensory monitoring of the lower and upper limb, if appropriate, is all checked out before the surgeon drapes. And this is what we want to see. Here is the journey. 
stimulate the tibial nerve. Here it is passing the tibial uh, uh, popliteal fossa. Here's the esophageal electrode, the ear electrode, the nasopharyngeal and neck electrodes, and two scalp electrodes. We've got multiple channels for security because if one of them fails during the surgery, we have a fail-safe so that we can fall back. Somatosensory monitoring, essential. Motor evoked potentials, also essential in combination. And we, a little bit like I mentioned with the deep tumours, we put an array of electrodes on the scalp where we can, with an electrical train of stimuli, stimulate with a little bit of current that goes through to the skull to stimulate the motor cortex. And here's a patient, we're stimulating the scalp. You'll see the ear twitching a little bit. Neck and we've got multiple needles in limb muscles and measuring tiny motor responses that uh, we can see downstream. Now, in addition to scoliosis and corrective uh, spinal surgery, we're also involved in spina cord and spina and cauda equina surgery. We use somatosensory evoked potentials, lower and upper limb, depending on the level of the surgery, motor evoked potentials using that transcranial stimulation that I've described, but in addition, direct spinal cord or nerve root stimulation if that's what the surgeon needs, as well as real-time EMG. For intrinsic spinal cord lesions, we'll provide the surgeon with a handheld bipolar stimulator to directly stimulate the spinal cord. Here's spinal cord tumour surgery. The, the surgeon has peeled the dura back. He's just trying to take the pier off now. And then by a combination of stimulation and recording, we try and keep the... And here he is with the stimulator. He's been cutting the tumour out. Cutting, uh, stimulating is, can I cut that out? Yes, no, stimulating throughout the procedure. And the, see, the, and the surgeon is, has a tailored resection to try and minimise harm by doing motor evoked potentials. Nerve root stimulation in spina, uh, spina, uh, spina uh, uh, cauda equina surgery, you can directly stimulate uh, uh, nerve roots to say, oh yes, that's going to the foot, that's going to the thigh. And if you tickle up or irritate the uh, uh, nerve roots, little electrical discharges start to occur in the muscles that you can record from. Short and long discharges, and just for fun, I thought I'd. Here's what one sounds like. That's what one sounds like a neurotonic discharge. And so we say to the surgeon, oh, whatever you're doing, it's tickling up that nerve root. Maybe you want to be a bit careful. Finally, there's two other areas of surgery that I'll mention briefly to you. One that I'm not involved in is because the surgeon does it themselves. During spinal fixation, very often pedicle screws are put in in order to be the anchor points for the rods that, uh, for uh, fusions and other procedures, orthopedic and spinal. These pedicle screws go through the pedicle and hopefully the surgeon places them so that they don't irritate the nerve roots. They can actually put an electrical stimulator down the hole they've made and if they are able to stimulate the nerve and get a muscle twitch with a very low current they've probably breached the bony lamina and so it can tell them whether their hole is a little too shallow or not. And finally carotid end arterectomy. Back to the brain and back to EEG again. Now surgeons do great job by clearing out very narrow arteries. And here it is live. Here's the common carotid artery. Here's the internal carotid artery. Here's the common carotid artery clamped. Now the surgeon can open up the internal carotid artery. And this, by the way, is atheroma. And here's the atheroma being taken out of the vessel. Amazing, isn't it? Now, during the process of clamping the carotid artery, hey, maybe there's not so much blood getting to the brain. Maybe a stroke might occur. Maybe that's not such a good idea. And so the surgeons have different approaches. Some say, oh, well, I just clamp the artery and I'm so speedy. Um, it's all over, so I don't mother. It doesn't matter. Other people say, oh, well, I want to put a shunt in every time I clamp. And so here's a, a shunt. It's a plastic tube is put into the common carotid and then a, a narrow plastic tube into the internal carotid. 
The problem with putting a shunt in is that ramming that plastic tube can dislodge atheroma and produce problems itself. And so if you just want to selectively shunt people who only really need it, you need a way of monitoring brain function whilst you clamp the artery. And this is where we come in. EEG monitoring is, uh, under general anaesthetic is a traditional and very powerful technique for allowing selective shunting to occur. Uh, Tor Sunt and Frank Sharbro at the Mayo Clinic um, introduced this so long ago. And what happens with EEG is this. You have a particular anaesthetic pattern for your EEG. This is the left hemisphere, midline right hemisphere. Here's 30 seconds after clamping. Fast activity disappears. Slow wave activity occurs. And you'll notice that the change is bilateral. Bilateral ischemia. This is a, a, an alarm for the surgeon to put a shunt in. And here's shunt restoring uh, the, the levels again. Another approach which is less widespread in its coverage is SEPs, a median somatosensory evoked potential before clamping. After clamping, it drops. 60 seconds, it's even more dropping. And then you're putting a, a, a shunt in. So this is a bit of an overview of how we can monitor. We can monitor the brain. We can monitor cranial nerves. We can monitor spinal cord. We can monitor... Um, brain function during vascular procedures. And I might add that same spinal monitoring that I described to you, we use in selective aortic surgery as well. And this monitoring is very time intensive and challenging. And that's the reason why so few of us are doing it. Because you can't rush off to a clinic. You can't expect the surgery is going to begin and end at the right time. And that's why ultimately, and this is uh, from an article um, uh, Atif Hussain wrote a few years ago, um, interoperative monitoring is going to become a neurological subspecialty because it's really not for the dilettante. You really need to know what you're doing with a very experienced technical medical team with the anaesthetist who you know and trust and a surgeon who is patient with you because you have to set things up and make sure everything is working before the surgery starts. So, finally, to end, I've got to return to where we've begun. Professor Tan Chong Tin and his wonderful wife Irene who's here today which is a great pleasure. There is no one who I admire and respect more than Chong Tin. Like so many of you, I regard him um, and I'm blessed to have him as my mentor and friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor John Dunn. Now we would like to move on to our second lecture by Professor Lim Shi Hui. Let me briefly introduce him. He is the Professor and Senior Associate Dean, Department of Academic Development, Office of Academic and Clinical Development at the Duke NUS Medical School and the Senior Consultant Neurologist at the National Neuroscience Institute and Singapore General Hospital. He was the founding president of the College of Physicians Singapore and the master of the Academy of Medicine Singapore. He was the chairman and the president of the... <laughs> I didn't realise you're next to me. <laughs> um, okay, I'll carry on, Prof. Sorry. <laughs> okay. He was the chairman and the president of the ASEAN Neurological Association, ASNA. He was also the chairman of the Commission on As Asian Oceanian Affairs of the International League Against Ac uh, Epilepsy and the Asian Epilepsy Academy, where he initiated an EEG certification examination in Asia in 2005 for his outstanding contributions and exemplary dedication towards medical education and training in Singapore and throughout the region, he received the National Outstanding Clinica Clinician Educator Award in 2015. Please welcome Professor Lim. Sorry, I didn't know that whatever submitted all read out. <laughs> I thought it would be like summarized again. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, um, to be here to celebrate with uh, Chong Tin. I first knew him in 1993. 
I met him in Vancouver, the World Congress on Neurology. I think during the exhibition, someone just walked in. I said, who are you? <laughs> he said, I'm from Singapore. So that's how we, we, we met each other, met in 1993. Um, and I think 25 years is not a short time. Um, as you, we all know, we value a few things in life. We had to value our own body so that we can keep fit and uh, live a meaningful life. We need to value our family. And the third thing we need to value is friendship. So I think I'm very glad to have Chong Tin as a friend um, and continue for almost 25 years. So I thought maybe I would just go through some of, his, uh, some of the old photos we have managed to find if I knew that um, because when he told me about this and I haven't really had time to actually search my database and, uh, but I managed to find some you see how young he was <laughs> young and handsome I think that was a word uh, actually he's still young he's still young the, the age is only a digit and uh, he, he's actually uh, 30 years old right with 40 years of experience that's why he's <laughs> Okay, so I've, this, I managed to find the 1996 photo. This is the first uh, ASEAN Aplastic Conference in Singapore. Um, then a year later, we have uh, our second biannual convention of the uh, ASEAN Neurological Association. So, uh, good time. Uh, and you see the 1997 jump to 202. I think at the time, I was probably having hard copies of the photo. Um, then after we have uh, SD card. So I think all these were uh, stored somewhere, but managed to find some. So 2002, this is in uh, Ulaanbaatar. Then to Bandung, um, I think that was where, yeah, we started a series of uh, 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 educational courses uh, under the name of ASIPA, which is, came a year later. Four different photos in 2004. I think this is during the AOEC. We have a commission. So Chongqing is the second... Uh, Chair of the Asian Oceania, uh, uh, the Commission of Asian Oceania Affair, uh, and also the second uh, chair of the uh, uh, Asian Epilepsy Academy. Then we have other uh, adventure. Okay, so maybe the first one is two zero zero four in Beijing. Yeah, uh, this and uh, Professor Seno was the first uh, uh, chair of the commission as well as uh, Sipa. Uh, Irene was there, uh, and this is Vien Vien Tian. Oh, I realized that uh, a lot of times uh, Chong Tin took more photos on me than I took for him. Uh, maybe that's why I couldn't find some of them. Uh, so Chong Tin doesn't carry a camera. He doesn't carry a phone. So I was the operator. Sometimes uh, if he needs to be contacted, so I will be contacted. Uh, and he's my cameraman. So we went everywhere, uh, except when Irene was around, so I, I could stand there and uh, have a photo with him. So this was in uh, uh, Laos. Uh, and Kunming. So Kunming, you saw the, the stone garden, which is here. Really nice place. Um, and so we have gone round. Ah, so this is unique because I think uh, I only found one photo. And the whole photo was you. <laughs> <laughs> I think he took my photo, I took his photo, so that's why we are not together. Okay, so Penang, uh, Kinjin was there. I think we have our meetings. Uh, this is in Tokyo. Uh, then we went to Haikou, uh, China. So I, I mean, I'm a Hananese, so it was actually a nice uh, time that I went back there. Uh, so, so you can see that we really enjoy our educational activities, sightseeing. This is the Epilepsy Congress in Singapore. Um, back to Samarang in 2008, and we continue our journey. Philippines, Sri Lanka, back to Beijing. Uh, Makasa and Big Banquet. Uh, Chongtin is somewhere here. As you can see, John Dunn's picture start to appear. So that's him, that's him, that's him. <laughs> and I think, yeah, the photographer was John Dunn. So this is why he was not there. <laughs> this is in Chongqing. Uh, and they all, we all came down to Singapore, we had a retreat, uh, so this is uh, Garden by the Bay. Um, and we also enjoyed not just food, but uh, this was actually recommended by Didi, so I think this is in Padang, uh, so Durian Feast. 
Chong Tin looks lonely, right? Huge place, but alone. But actually, all of us were just just here. He, he walked first, and uh, and he. W- so I think he enjoyed see, seeing things uh, around him, and and from and and look far. Uh, okay, so back to Ho Chi Minh. Ah, so this is uh, in uh, Macau and uh, during the AOS, uh, CN. We started the EG exam, and so he's one of the examiner, one of the kind examiners. So I, I, I don't know whether you will continue to examine, but if you get him in exams, you are more likely to pass than not pass. <laughs> uh, Guangzhou, and this was in Taipei. I think we enjoy our food. Uh, King Xiang was there, uh, John. You see, when he talked, everybody looked and listened. Okay, so back 2017, uh, which is actually just a month ago. So as you can see, John, uh, Chong Tin, and I uh, have been traveling together. So you see three of our photos um, more frequently now. Actually, this is this morning. <laughs> so he dragged us to the Batu Cave, and uh, so we climbed all the way. We went to the dark side of the cave, and I said, what if we can't... See, uh, John said he doesn't really know the place, but he knows how to describe the place, even if he doesn't know. Um, and of course, we are in the dark side of the cave, so it's like blind leading the blind. So all of you want to do double blind study, go to this cave. <laughs> but Chong Jing, even though he sees the big picture, but he also paid a lot of attention to details. You see, he start, I'm not sure what he's studying. <laughs> but, but more important is that he's also far-sighted. You see, this is what he sees. So he's a visionary leader, far-sighted, kind examiners, but most important, he's an excellent educator. So I think this is why we have a common journey. This photo tells us that this is the common interest. We define tomorrow's medicine by educating the next or younger generation of doctors or healthcare professionals. We enjoy food and we enjoy scenery. We can just walk and walk and walk without knowing where we are walking sometimes. Uh, maybe because we are exercising. Uh, so we go to a, a different uh, congress. This is how we uh, pass our time. Okay. Um, well, let's back to the, the talk that I'm, I want to give today. Uh, related to training and education. Using neurology as an example, and I will emphasize on how important is building cap, uh, competency, but more important is develop our capabilities along the way. Well, it looks quite a lot, but many of my slides are actually a picture slides, so I will just emphasize on important points. Uh, so this is what I will be covering, uh, training, education, and others. I think we need to have uh, the correct terminology, then we understand what we are talking about. Okay, so this is... How we develop people, we can coach them, train them, mentoring them, or teaching them. So this actually, this diagram shows you, uh, these are the specific topics, general topics, so you know what you are doing. You may be mentoring, but actually not training, and vice versa. So I think this one explains all. We are all clinical teachers. Teaching is very straightforward. We teach because we actually tell them, tell our so-called students what they need to know. So we actually brainwash them, we teach them. But education is different. The objective of education is not teaching but learning. There are many ways of learning. Teaching is just one of them. We, are, we tend to teach the way we teach. And we assess them and say, you must pass. If you don't pass, it means that you are not paying attention. But if a child or if a learner can't learn the way we teach, then we should teach the way they learn. We have to be updated ourselves. We need to change. We cannot be static and remain the same throughout the 10, 20, 30 years. So we ourselves need to be educated to be, so that we can educate our next generation. In fact, when we teach, the one that learns the most is actually us. Right, I'm sure you all know about this learning pyramid. So if you teach others, you become better. Uh, I, I think many of you are uh, in the academic lines. Uh, you Believe me, the more you teach, the better you are. You say the correct thing because you cannot say the wrong thing. I'm showing this picture is because uh, actually Chong Tin is an educator, not a teacher. He inspires 
all of us to learn. They locate, he locates the intelligence and abilities within another, drawing them out for all, even the students to see. So this is the difference between a teacher and the an educator. And Chongtin is an example of an educator. Okay, back to training and education. Training is very specific. For example, you learn BCLS. You, you train to acquire a certain skill. The assessment is pass or fail. You pass, you must pass. Because you don't pass, patient die. So that is training. Training is to build, to develop competency. The task is very focused, very specific, and we need to deliver. But education is different. Learner is responsible, and we focus on preparing them for unknown future. And we need them to think independently. So this is why open and critical thinking is important in education. So we need actually making them think from the basic and prepare for the future, which is unknown. Uh, this may be too basic, but I think education is a passport to the future because tomorrow belongs to those who, uh, people who prepare for it today. So if you did... In, I always like to show the slide on uh, the right on the right side to all the finance people, because if they think that education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> I'm not sure whether there are financial people here, but uh, they always say, "Why you ask for? Why you put so much budget? Not use, not important. Slash it." But uh, when something happened, then they realize that education is uh, is the is is a way to go. Okay, so health professional education is a bridge to quality. Uh, quality means patient safety. So if, if we don't learn, patient will die in front of us. So I think this, and over the years we have changed uh, from a, uh, the all star structure process education to a competency based uh, health professional education, which I will elaborate. Okay. So now what is I'll touch on what is competency and competency based education. Competence refers to a person's ability or skills. Uh, that we possess us to do a certain task. Whereas competency refers to, uh, of a job refers to a description, how things have to be done at what level. So competence uh, or competency is an observable ability uh, that integrates and combines multiple components, right? which include knowledge, skills, attitudes. Uh, it's a spectrum. It's something that is measurable and we can actually define the outcome. Right. So if you are competent, means you can do this job well. And there are different domains of competency. But if you are not that competent or this competent, you may be lacking in one or two domains. But if you are totally incompetent, you are actually not competent in all domains. But all our bosses want us to be super competent, right? Yeah. Okay, anyway, if you are super competent, they can actually sleep without being disturbed at night. Otherwise, a phone call will, will, will ring at home and so on. So I think when we train people to be competent, they must be really competent. Okay, just another um, difference between traditional ed education uh, and competency-based ed education. So it's outcome-based, active learning, collaboration, evidence-based or research-driven, learner center, and we use all sorts of media including social media to learn. In the old days, we have a curriculum. Then we decide, okay, what's the education objective? Then we do the assessment. But now things has changed. Healthcare needs decide on what competency this person should have. So we define, as a neurologist, you need to be competent in this history taking, this examination, and so on. Then we plan the curriculum. Then we plan the assessment. It's the other way around. Not, uh, no, not, and we also need to be sure that the trainees are truly competent to progress to the next level. So everything is outcome-based. The issue is that who decides the outcome? Is it the profession? For example, the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia? Or is it the society? They decide the outcome. Who decides the neurologist to be, must be this, this? Or is it some one from outside uh, our society or country, like in a regional organization or in an international organization, 
Then if you want to specialize in movement disorder or epilepsy, for example, should ILA decide what kind of competency you should have? Or should it be policy maker, like, you, like the university? Or is it the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Education? Or the public? I hope not the public. <laughs> but at least someone here had to decide what kind of outcome you want to, to achieve uh, in training someone. Okay, let me go bring you through various models of competency framework. Um, I'm, you might have encountered uh, certain uh, terms that you will see in publication and so on. So competency frameworks start with broad, distinguishable areas of competence and in the aggregate, they define the, desi the desired outcome. So I thought I would just bring you through a few of the examples. Like for example, CAMET's uh, Rose uh, framework. In Canada, they think that doctors should be a medical expert, also a communicator, a professional, scholar, collaborator, manager, or health advocate. So this is how they train uh, them so that they can become one of this group of people. KSA, uh, later on I'll bring it back again, uh, but I will just give you a brief introduction. Actually, it's very simple. When I was uh, training many years ago, I was told that you need to be knowledgeable, you must have the skill, you must have the correct attitudes. So the curriculum will design based on, okay, in this uh, knowledge, what do you need to acquire? So knowledge can be clinical knowledge, basic science knowledge, and the application of which. Then, of course, skills can be uh, uh, clinical skills, which is like history taking, physical examination, communication skill with patient, relative, colleagues, written, verbal, and so on. Uh, but most important is the attitudes. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that later. This RIME model is actually started in the medical school. Uh, reporter, interpreter, manager, and educator. And it's actually for year three medical students. So in year three medical students, what do you need to achieve? For example, introduce in the curriculum. P is practice. Uh, M is like you must have uh, reached certain proficiency. Uh, but I think most of us are not using this model. The Dreyfus developmental model. Uh, can I just check? You, is this something very uh, is this common, commonly used? Okay. Well, there are five levels. Novice, advanced, beginner, competent, proficient, and expert. And after the expert, you become the master. I'll give some example who, who are master. And, okay, this is an example. <laughs> Can you see? It's a bit dark. Yeah, so they're all the master. Uh, but there are four levels of uh, to mastery, right? Actually, most of the time, we, you do not know what you do not know. One day you say, hey, how come I do not know this? And that means you reach the second stage, which is conscious uh, incompetent. With that, then you will go and study and you learn. And after a while, you do things even without thinking. You can even report EEG without looking at the EEG. <laughs> Something like that. Maybe EMG, you just spoke. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, when you become the master, Everything is spontaneous. Just like brushing teeth, tiling your shoelace. You are the master, right? You don't think of what to do anymore. Okay, so these are the four levels that we go through. But maybe if I use this to illustrate. Okay, this is actually time-based. Uh, our training may be three to eight years. Um, then after post-training phase. And competency equal to patient safety. So you must draw this line. This is an important line. So when we start training, Right? Let's say we reach here, we're supposed to be competent because competent equal to patient safety. But actually most of the time, it's actually lower. Uh, so even you become a consultant or whatever, you continue to learn. That's where you reach. But actually very easy from competent to become discompetent if you do not continue. Let's say if you are a general neurologist and I pursue my uh, subspecialty training, which is epilepsy and, and, and my other few, maybe movement disorder, stroke, start to deteriorate. <laughs> yeah, you, you can be a general nephrologist. You concentrate on just kidney, and then the rest. Yeah, so I'm just giving uh, this how example. <laughs> People say, you no, know, the hand surgeon specialized in index finger. No, no, count. Yeah. <laughs> But we need to continue to learn from competent to proficient. And sometimes we need the support, maybe the university or MOH or maybe society. Perhaps maybe this cartoon will show you 
What is novice? This kung fu fighter, uh, kung, kung, fu, kung fu panda. So this is novice, but advanced beginner. So he start to actually learn without knowing that he's actually balancing himself fairly well while eating. But to be competent, because if, he, if you're not competent, you'll be killed by the enemy. But if you want to lead a team, you need to be proficient or reach the expert. So I hope, I hope this one actually gives you some idea what is... Uh, so if you are just one person doing the work, it's okay to be competent. To lead a team, you need to be proficient or expert. And of course, one day you become the master, like Chong Tin. <laughs> so you understand, right? Yeah, so he's the master. He is the true master. Okay. Uh, there are other, other framework, ACGME, ABMS. This is something that we are doing uh, in Singapore. So we have uh, patient care, medical knowledge, practice space, learning, improvement, all these things. Uh, and American Board of Medical Specialists also have the similar six domain of competency. There are others. I think I'll just... Uh, I thought this one is important because the Association of American Medical Colleges define 150 types of competency. They group them, short list 58, and put them into eight domains. It's called the Physician Competency Reference Set. The first six are the ones that are used in ACGMB, but the seven and the eight, I don't know why it was not included. It's so important. We don't work alone. We work as a team. There's so much of the interprofessional collaboration. Doctors work with nurses, allied health, to provide a care. The, in, the IPC comes with interprofessional education, so something that we cannot ignore. But as a professional, we need to continue to develop ourselves. This is what I call the personal and professional development. So for example, like education, I need to go for faculty development in education, learn how to teach. Uh, so the PPD is important, and the last part is uh, combining all different types of... Uh, I, I don't think I want to go through this. Let me just move on. Uh, building competency, identifying the outcome. Actually, there are three components, which is what you see here. Uh, actually, there's a fourth one, which is actually the quality assurance part. Uh, we need to conduct certain uh, QI uh, project to see whether the program is actually doing well. But anyway, let me just go to the... So what are competent clinicians? I think KSA model is the standard. We need to be knowledgeable, skillful, and must have the correct attitude. Knowledge is in the brain. Skills is in the hand. But the attitude is in your heart. So you need all these three. Because if we do not have the values of behavior, it's actually very dangerous. Integrity without knowledge is weak, but knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. Actually, when we uh, recruit uh, trainees, uh, bring them into the training system, what we are looking at is not how high the scores. It can be in the dean's list or the A's, but this may be the problem uh, candidates because if we, we only know, we have to ask around, is this person a team player before we let them enter into the training program? So this could be the, um, uh, this is the importance of integrity. Uh, okay, so defining the performance level for each competency. I think this is what we are using called the milestones, which is telling us that a certain part of your training, what do you need to achieve? You must reach that level. Undergraduate only two, uh, which is the novice and also the performance uh, aspect of a graduating doctor. But when it comes to graduate medical education, it's actually five, um, five levels, level all, one to five, and we want them to reach level four at least. And for example, yeah, it depends. You see, when you assess someone, you cannot uh, compare year one with year three uh, trainees because they are at a different level. So I think when we assess them, this, this is just to say that we have different level of expectation. Uh, and even the milestone must be must come with certain time frame. At six months, you must you should be able to do this. At nine months, at twelve months, and so on. This AC Jamie had this milestone initiative. My suggestion is that you just Google. They are all free on the internet. So this is actually the neurology one. Uh, we have the epilepsy. Uh, we have the epilepsy one. So for example, let me just yeah. They have these five levels. Then. 
you, when you assess them at 6 months, 12 months, 18 months, you give them a take. For example, in patient care, are they able to get the correct neurological history? Yeah. So this actually helps you to track them. So in, his, in history taking, neurological examination, this is the epilepsy one, medical management, surgical management of epilepsy uh, patients, uh, emergent or critical care management, like treatment of status epilepticus. If you are only here, you are year three trainee, I think you, are a lot, you have a lot to catch up. So actually this one help. You, we can use this to guide our assessment. And even localization of the focus. Uh, for example, you must know your neurophysiology method, MRI methods and so on. Diagnostic investigation, classification of seizure. They're all on the internet. So I think this is very useful. And I think I'll just move on to the, the last part, which is yeah, even the ethical part. So they cover almost every aspect uh, of the different domains of competency. So this one provides a learner with a clear path. There's no surprises. We will tell the trainee, have you reached here? They, they can see themselves. Okay, so I need to reach there. And also formative feedback. There are other criticisms which I think, uh, I don't think I have time to go through it. There are also other challenges and so on. Okay, then there's also developing framework. There's such thing called assessment. There are many types of assessment like MCQs, uh, OSCE type. Uh, when you need to show your competency, you need to use OSCE. So you must use the correct assessment method if you want. For example, like you have the patient care, record review, chart review, checklist. So I think education appears to be getting more and more complex. But if you really want to assess the competency of a, a particular learner, you may have no choice to use the correct tool. Okay, so medical knowledge, practice-based learning, uh, professionalism, what can you do to assess all these domains? There's another one, it's called the entrustable professional activities. Uh, I think I'll just skip this because this one just shows you that work-based Workplace-based assessment is essential. You may know everything in knowledge in exam setting, but in come to the real life, you need to see how they perform at the workplace. Okay, just a little bit uh, uh, overview of the neurology residency uh, uh, system in Singapore. In the, this were the old days, we have this. Now we have the residency training system, which is five to eight years for neurology, uh, well, all the residency training are under this entity called Specialist Accreditation Board. So they decide all the competency of the specialists. So whatever training we have, they monitor, uh, they track, and they give accreditation if you pass the exam. With the accreditation, then you can register yourself as a specialist. So residency program in Singapore is, a, is an institutional structure Emphasize on a lot of learning, giving protected time for trainers, and there's a lot of regular formative assessment. And we work together, we engage the ACGME so that they have been in Singapore for the last five years. But of course, at the end of 10 years, we will have our own system. And this is the JCST system. Uh, uh, I think I was the JCST co-chair for four years, so I understand the system quite well. So they are also a tripartite uh, a relationship. So we have the training institution in the hospital using ACGME as an external consultant and we have the regulator which is the MOH and so on. To get into the neurology residency training, we need to have three years internal medicine, then go into three years of neurology. That's it. But without going through internal medicine, you cannot. Uh, even Doctors come to Singapore with MRCP, they, they have to start all over again. We do not recognize the MRCP because MRCP is just an assessment. We need to see whether they have gone through the training process. Uh, so we have three institutions and to enter, they need to have MRCP as well as American Board of Internal Medicine to enter into the neurology training program. So their learning goals and objective, we must have a rotation plan and they still have to do internal medicine. In that three years of neurology, they need to spend two months each per year in that three years to do general internal medicine. Because I think 
uh, this is the way we want them to go. Uh, continue to keep up with general internal medicine. So they handed to do internal medicine call. Cross campus rotation, they had to keep all the logbook. These are the ah, assessment. I think assessment drive learning behavior. But if you only have one assessment method, how do you expect the fish to climb the tree? So this is uh, so that, that's why we need to have different methods of assessment, mini CX, trend 60, case-based discussion, uh, and so on. So this is medical knowledge, this is patient care, and so on. All of them had to go for the in-training assessment, the OSCE type, which is annually conducted in May. Formative for the first and the second year residents, but summative for the graduating resident. Then they had to take the neurology uh, uh, MRCP specialist uh, uh, exam uh, to pass. So they have promotion criteria, graduating criteria, and they had to do QI project. I'm lucky that I'm 30 years <laughs> older. No need to go through this. I, I'm just thinking whether I can survive. Okay, never mind. Uh, then we have to assess the program. We assess the trainer. Okay, never. So this is just the training phase. We still have another 10, 20, or 30 years of practicing phase. So actually, there's no end to learning. But all of us are already inside, right? Uh, yeah, the dean said, it's not too late to be cardiologist. Or, but maybe it's not too late to be a non-doctor, do something else earlier. <laughs> okay, the last part. Generic professional capability. I touched on the competency, so the question is, uh, is being competent good enough? Do you know that there's such a test called good enough test? I think the pediatrician knows. It's a draw a man's test. It's uh, devised by good enough, uh, Lawrence good enough. He's, uh, she's a professor in psychology. So there's a good enough test, but I'm not, I'm not introducing this test. Okay, anyway, so to be competent, Okay, this is where we are. We train someone so that they are competent to handle routines. But our challenges are complex. We need to educate them to prepare them for uncertainties. So being competent is not good enough, right? They need to be more capable. So we are looking at using the generic professional capability framework of the GMC, uh, which not just having knowledge, skills, and attitude, we are looking into education, research. I think many of us are doing this already, especially if you are in a university setting. But patient advocates, leadership, health promotion, and safeguards. So these are the nine generic professional capabilities of GMC. And we are modifying for the Singapore usage. So we not only want our doctors to be a good practitioner, communicators, and collaborators, but we want them to be HCP+. Plus. So like clinician educators like Tan Chong Tin, clinician, clinician researcher scientists also Tan Chong Tin. You just look at him, then you know, you actually possible, you can actually follow his footstep. No need to wear his shoes, he's so big, but just follow his footstep. He's also administrator and leaders. And I think we all talk about safety and uh, yeah. So I think I have cover, uh, but the coverage is good enough. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lim Shi Hui. Okay. Uh, next, we would like to celebrate this uh, Fast Trip Symposium with a video on the lifetime achievements of Professor Dato Dr. Tan Chong Ting before we invite. Uh, Professor Tan to deliver his lecture. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy uh, the journey of Professor Siti Tan.
Professor Dr. Dr. Tan Chong Ting was born in Penang on October 27, 1948. He received his early education at Chung Ling High School and obtained his medical degree from University of Melbourne in 1972. He joined University of Malaya as a lecturer in 1977 and was awarded a Commonwealth Medical Fellowship to the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square, London in 1982. In 1990, he was awarded MD by the University of Malaya and was appointed full professor in 1992. He is married to Madam Irene Ye Siu Hong and they have two sons, Dr. Tan Li Ping and Mr. Tan Li Kuo. Through his dedication, clarity of vision, originality, and ability to combine clinical and scientific skills, Professor Tan Chong Ting has made numerous important discoveries in clinical neurology. His earliest work was in establishing the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in Malaysia. In 1998, a mysterious and rapidly fatal encephalitis affected more than 200 individuals in pig farming communities in the state of Negeri Milan, Malaysia. Professor Tan led a team of clinicians and scientists across different specialties in the University of Malaya to study and combat the disease. Their groundbreaking work led to the landmark discovery of Nipah virus encephalitis in 1999 and publications in top medical journals including The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. The Nipah virus encephalitis investigation team was conferred the prestigious Mahathir Science Award in 2006 and the Medeka Award in 2008. Professor Tan, together with younger specialists he has nurtured and trained, has continued to make significant contributions in urology, including most recently, identification of sarcocystis nesbiti as the cause of fibromyositis in humans, characterization of tuberculous meningitis, and improved understanding of psychological aspects of epilepsy. Professor Tan has been a strong advocate for research in clinical neurology and the neurosciences in Asia. He has been the editor-in-chief of Neurology Asia for over two decades. Professor Tan was one of the pioneers in developing clinical neurology and neurophysiology services in Malaysia. As the division head of neurology at the University of Malaya Medical Center, from 1992 to 2015, he was involved in training more than 50 Malaysian neurologists and was instrumental in formalizing the neurology subspecialty training program in the country. He was chair of the National Specialist Register for Neurology from 2005 to 2013. His dedication to neurology training in underserved regions of the world has also seen more than 50 neurology fellows come through the unit from countries such as Myanmar, Indonesia, Laos, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Mongolia, Nigeria, Sudan, and Mozambique. Over the years and in many ways, Professor Tan has helped to bridge the gaps in neurology and education, especially in developing countries. Besides speaking at various international conferences, Professor Tan was a founding member of several important neurological societies which promote education research and networking in the region. These include the Malaysian Society of Neurosciences, MSN, ASEAN Neurological Association, ASNA, and Pan-Asian Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis, PEPTRI. Professor Tan has served as Vice President of the International League Against Epilepsy, ILAE, and helped to form the Commission of Asian and Oceanian Affairs and Asian Epilepsy Academy, ASAPA, within the ILAE. For his outstanding contribution to the development of neuroscience in Malaysia, Professor Tan was awarded the MSN Lifetime Achievement Award in August 2017. As we celebrate a lifetime of dedication in clinical neurology and neuroscience today, Professor Dato Tan Chong Ting has been, and will always be, an inspiration to us in the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome Professor Datuk Dr. Tan Chong Ting to deliver his lecture on 
Development of Neurology in the University of Malaya. Uh, thank you, Jean. Thank you, uh, Professor Sanjeev. Thank you, uh, Shi Hui and uh, John, uh, Professor Go, my colleagues, uh, uh, my colleagues from many places in the country. Uh, thanks for you to come. And uh, Dr. Samuel, he's come all the way from Penang. Is I, I deeply respect uh, him. Uh, not because he come, but because <laughs> of his practice and dedication. Well, uh, I, you know, you I probably won't get many chance to 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 talk in this platform, so I thought maybe I should uh, share with you something that uh, about history, because I'm a believer in history. Uh, I listed there why I think history is important. Uh, not only giving credit to those who have contributed, because uh, it understanding the past allows us to understand the current. And uh, shared memory is a basis of identity. And not just make us, uh, you know, it's a sense of... Uh, belonging, but actually it's a very powerful way how we make up our mind and sense of responsibility. Uh, you, you know, you do things a lot of time because you, because of our own identity. And I think it's important to, to history is important to document the institutional values and provide models. So I believe in history, so I want to spend uh, a bit of time to talk about how neurology developed uh, in, in, the, uh, in UMM's, UM. You know, the uh, UM, uh, these are the early peoples who have uh, uh, pioneers of of neurology in 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 this place, uh, I put Danaraj there because of, he's sort of half neurologist. Uh, you know, he's interested in neuro in neurology, and then Soma Sundram, uh, he actually laid the foundation of uh, neuro lab and neurology in the hospital, and because of because of D J Danaraj. He's a half neurologist, so there's a lot of emphasis on neuro lab and neurology. So it gets started well. And Soma, he actually still practices in New York today, uh, I think in his mid 80s. And he was a professor of neurology in, uh, in Dam State University. And then Dr. Yi, he died uh, a few years ago. And he was a Singapore NNI Singapore's uh, director of research. At McNandra, he passed away a couple of years ago in Sydney. Actually, they are all outstanding people. Yesterday, I was in, you know, two days ago, I was in China, and then met some of the, our our Sydney colleagues, and they were talking of McNandra, who was the earliest person to describe. This, uh, some of you may be familiar with the term sharp transience of sleep post, which actually defines stage one sleep. So he actually done some uh, landmark work and, uh, and, and they were sent uh, overseas for training. Uh, other than Dr. Soma Sundram, uh, they, they were sent to Norway and... and and uh, and and so on. Okay, you were sent to uh, London, and McNandra was sent to West uh, West Coast Seattle, and of course uh, T.G. Lo. Uh, T.G. Lo uh, was sent to Norway, and uh, the rest all actually left us by the time I joined. 
I, I sort of were left with them for a few months. Uh, after that, I was left to work with uh, T.G. Lo, and T.G. Lo really was uh, my teacher and uh, contributed and stayed behind until 1992. And he was a deputy dean, so he had a very busy job. So I was actually running around doing most of the uh, <laughs> most of the bread and butter job uh, until uh, Dr. C.C. Ho joined us in 1982. Dr. C.C. Ho was a top student, but he but he didn't really stay with us long. La. He went to London for training, come back and join by practice. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, in the old days, uh, it's a lot of internal medicine, and you practice uh, neurology as a special interest. So you read EG, I was told by my head of the Department of Medicine, in your spare time. And you do a research in your spare time because this is your interest. It's a very cute way of looking at how work and interests and so on, which I, you know, but this is how it was. Uh, and uh, we had a li laboratory, we added, uh, and then we started, as I said, we started EMG and EG early, and we had four lab technician. And the first time I was sort of fortunate enough to attend a conference uh, was to go to Bangkok four years after I joined as an academic staff. Actually, before I sort of end my job, I virtually travel every month, you know. <laughs> <coughs> it was quite different then. Uh, it was quite different. Uh, I think things are really, you know, in a way, a lot of you are like in a honeymoon all the time. Uh, in 1982-1983, I was in Queen Square as a Commonwealth Fellow. Of course, I have many, many teachers, uh, including John and uh, Shi Hui. They are all my teachers. But I, I want to recognize two persons who are, uh, you know, uh, Gilead and Piggy Thomas, who, who I came under them as a, uh, a fellow uh, registrar in Queen Square. They teach me how to think. I think this is what they taught me, uh, more than just neurology. So I want to give tribute to them. So these are the people uh, who, uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, Dr. Lee Moon Kin joined us for 10 years. And uh, he actually wanted to stay on, but anyway, uh, they, this is how it is. And, uh, and I, I did an MD at that time, and I will talk about this uh, later on, and published study, and then I founded the Malaysian Society of Neurosciences, I think 85 or so, 86 or something. Uh, there was a meeting uh, where the neurosurgeons are all around, uh, so, uh, T.G. Lo retired in early 1982, and I took over as head, and, uh, and then uh, listed there, we started uh, to, to do intraoperative monitoring. That's a scoliosis surgery, we, we work potentials, uh, we had sleep tests, uh, we started a sleep test done in 1993, uh, it, it was using paper. So every day after the test, there'll be a stack of paper, uh, and after a week, you know, you know the, the, the and then the hospital used to complain, we're well, gonna store all these papers, you know, uh, and and then uh, two o one we started to use digital uh, uh, recording, and ninety four I founded the ASEAN Neurological Association with the others. And then 96, the Neurological Journal of Southeast Asia, and then later on expanded to Neurology Asia. Well, there are two, thinking back, uh, interpreting the history, uh, actually I want to give 
I think one of the main reasons why neurology grew is because of John Bosco. John Bosco was a hematologist. He sort of sneaked into our department. Uh, he, he, he's not exactly an internist. But the thing about him is because he's a hematologist, so previously we can only practice neurology as a hobby. Now we are allowed to subspecialize. So, you know, so that's how different, and then of course he's, he, he built up his own uh, hematology. So, so we are allowed to build up the, the neurology and so on. So I give credit to John uh, for giving us freedom uh, to expand. John passed away in 1999. Uh, so the so because of uh, you know in 1995 we we have uh, uh, a neurology ward uh, 20 beds and John has his uh, hematology ward which is just next to our hematology ward uh, but before that it was part of 12A and 12B and then we could also expand. So in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Chiu Nikong was joined us, Kaysin, uh, Victor Chong, who is a great uh, colleague, and then Nipa outbreak in 1999. So after that, the, 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 the number of staff expand. Now, before I left, uh, before I stepped down, we have 14 uh, among the neurology team. You, it sounds a lot until you go to China, you see their neurology have 20 people, 30 people, you know. So it, it's, uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, with it comes the subspecialization, you know, because you have enough people uh, uh, to subspecialize. Uh, well, just now I mentioned. Uh, the reason why neurology grow, I give tribute to our leader in internal medicine who, who allowed the different subspecialty to, to, to grow. Actually, I think the other main reason for growing is a change of national policy, education policy. Uh, Prof. Adiba, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think in the early 2000, there was some change. Uh, I think uh, Prof. Fong, your father, at the time was a deputy higher education minister. Uh, and he, I think, played a role because he was a dean of the economics before he joined politics. And to say that, you know, allowed the professor to become, uh, 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 to, to hold, the, the person to hold, to, uh, it's a person to hold the promotion. So I think that is important because by the time last year we had six professors. I can see some of the universities had struggling like Hong Kong because they only have one professor of neurology. So the colleagues treat each other as competitors, uh, which is unhealthy. So, so here, as long as you reach a certain level, then you, you can become professor, and that allowed for growth in subspecialty and allowed for uh, uh, to, you know, the mature leadership from various leaders, uh, which I listed there, uh, and we can have teams and so on. So, uh, so as I said, there, it was uh, uh, what fight, uh, the, there's physical development, uh, we had uh, different wards. Uh, now we have uh, close to 50 beds, and our lab has also uh, expanded. Like what I listed there, how the EEG de developed. We, in 93, we started a video recording, but separate video and EEG. Uh, later on, is one button, uh, two buttons. You press it, and then there was a... Uh, the video recording, and then there's an EG until a system where they can fuse. And with uh, Professor uh, uh, King Xiang, he there was intracranial EG monitoring uh, uh, become 
more and more practice. We want to do more epilepsy surgery. <laughs> and here is a DCD and carotid Doppler and Doppler ultrasound, the peripheral nerve, uh, which has uh, from 2017. And as I listed there, the physical development of the hospital in neurology. And our lab tech has grown from four to now we have 22. So it's... Uh, uh, and of course, uh, neurology uh, by itself growing, uh, you, you need... Uh, the related field should also grow. And I uh, you know, want to give tribute uh, to... Uh, Vignes, uh, who have, because neurosurgery has always been sort of floating alive and dead and that sort of thing until <laughs> Vignes came and neuropediatrics uh, uh, with the Prof. Ong and Prof. Fong and, 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 and neuropath, of course, we always have our young men there, uh, uh, Prof. Katie Wong. Well, I want to say a few things uh, in terms of interpretation of history to say what are our values and what are our characteristics. Uh, I, I, I think we try to be excellent in service with good neuro, neurophysiological support. And the second one, we, ha have, we put a lot of emphasis on training, uh, education in all levels, and this is uh, our teaching program. Uh, weekly teaching program because when T.G. Lo was here, he said the way to do it is to have a standard teaching program all the time so you can plug in any time. So this is, the, we keep to this and, uh, and then we have our yearly sort of runs of lecture in neurophysiology that happen every week, every two weeks on neuropsychiatry and clinical neurology every week lectures, and then the case uh, conferences. Uh, we believe in research. So I, I want to quote three examples. Uh, uh, the first one was my own study. I want to mention this. Uh, in, 90, in the 1980s, uh, I embarked on an MD on MS. The main reason is because the, de the, the old dean, uh, our first dean, I remember he's, uh, very clearly, he said, that, that, you know, in the ward now teaching and so on, he said, there's no such thing as MS in Malaysia. So I got a bit uh, provoked, you know, prompted, okay. So I said, I must prove he's wrong. Uh, so, so as a young man, I went all over the country looking, tracing the patients, uh, you know, go and visit them in the kampong and so on to try to prove. Uh, but what I wanted to say is at that time there was very little guidance. And so what I did was uh, to submit papers for publications. And the reviewers was my guide. Because once I have the reverse report, I feel confident that I'm stepping on the right track, you know. So this is how I went through the, 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 the MD thesis. I say this to, because some of you may feel that you're not being guided. <laughs> <coughs> the second thing which I did was uh, at that time we see about half a dozen uh, give the caucus a year, and they stay for months in the ward, and half of them become blind, although they become okay. So it was a big problem. So I was trying to understand why these people become blind, and then the CT scan was normal. So, so sort of in a uh, way, I sort of tried to design a study that persuaded the, 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 the surgeon to go and do a shunt when the, the CT scan looked normal. So, you know, this was published uh, as a, uh, you know, and, and it has now become a standard practice. I say this not 
talking about you know not at this stage of my life to go and boast, uh, but to 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 say that you know you can really do things even when you are young and have limited resources if you think, you know if you think and if you imagine. Uh, you know, and theorize and hypothesize. You can prove things, you know. And so this was, uh, the, which I uh, am quite proud of, uh, you know, sort of in the old days uh, with very little. And, and both the studies don't have money. <laughs> no money, no money to support. Uh, and then, of course, the... Uh, the uh, you know, this was the basis of the of the study. The third one is the, of course, Nipa is uh, uh, is a difficult uh, problem to handle, and I think we did rise to the occasion, uh, which was just not mentioned. But I want to go back to the Nipa story, because uh, you see, the Nipa story started very simple. We started to have three or four patients coming to us, and then they die. And the reason, what a reason why, there are many reasons, uh, especially when you look backward, this is Nipah. But one of the main reason is because of very simple uh, uh, observation. This is the Nipah uh, Bukiplando village, and they have three. 6,000 Chinese, 3,000 Malays, 1,000 Indians. And all our patients were all Chinese or Indian, and there was no Malay. The observation is very simple. If it is a mosquito born, at the time it was thought to be a mosquito born illness, which is JE, surely the mosquito won't be able to tell who is a Chinese <laughs> and who is a. <laughs> and I remember also calling up, there's a river called Sungai uh, uh, Sepang, and there's a village called Sungai Pile. And Sungai Pile is also big rearing. And we had no patient from Sungai Pile. So I call up uh, the, the, some friend of mine who know the ge geography of the place from the village. I say, how wide is the uh, Sungai Pile, he said, Sungai, uh, uh, this uh, river, uh, Sungai Sepang, he says, maybe uh, uh, 50 meter or 30 meter. So 30 meter is no difficulty for the mosquito to fly over. <laughs> you know, because the mosquito, I was asked, uh, I was told you can fly for one kilometer. <laughs> so that's uh, provide another very strong conviction that this is really unrelated to mosquitoes. So I, I say, tell these stories to say that a lot of things, uh, you know, is, is to do with sitting down and think about things, you know. Uh, and I want to say about MIPA, of course we publish a lot of papers and, and so on. But interestingly, th this is a film called Contagion, and uh, it's about some outbreak, and, and the film is actually, the author, uh, director of the film said that the film is inspired by Nipah, it was inspired by the story of uh, SARS, and, and one other infection. So actually the Nipah, uh, our, our I can claim that our work, not just the impact is on one outbreak, but impact on the way the human being look at the environment and look at human. Okay, how environment, because it's to do with the bats and so, and bats to the pigs and so on, and human or bats to the, to the horses and human. So, it changes actually how humans look at the environment. So I am happy that our division of neurology has contributed in that sense, a different way of the uh, a human being look at animals, look at environment and human disease. 
So we can also contribute. So uh, uh, one of value is we got, I think we contribute to national neurology development. I, I mentioned about, uh, just now it was mentioned about, uh, you know, the training of half the neurologists in the country. It, it's not only me, you know, many of us, uh, so Prof Go was a president of Neuroscience Society. Now, uh, Professor uh, Lim, uh, K.S. Lim and and uh, a number of us were chairs of different things, and 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 the international contributions. Actually, I I say this because I'm a little worried that uh, uh, I'm glad that Dean talk about international contrib contribution, because I think we should maintain a global outlook, and some of the things that we do cost very little money. But I think the impact is enormous. Uh, for example, we have trained about 80, helped to train about 80% of the Burmese neurologists. And, uh, the, and the, the first four Lao neurologists were trained by us. And just imagine the enormous impact. You know, it's not my personal work, it's a work of. Uh, uh, of these countries' neurological practice and healthcare in this, uh, which you know is very little that we do in a way. We just allow them people to come and uh, teach them and so on. So I I I think uh, I think I am proud of this and 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 the of course we helped to form uh, uh, Prof Go also was a president of As ASEAN Neurological Association and a number of things that, that I'm proud that a lot of my our colleagues we all participate internationally uh, including Neurology Asia and and my you know uh, associate editors and so on and and John and uh, uh, Prof Dan and and she shows a lot of lots of pictures. Uh, it's as if we just spend all our time <laughs> <laughs> touring and so on. But I can tell you, yesterday uh, I just came back from China, and I think not me, uh, all of us. Uh, they keep telling us how much has our group contributed to Chinese development of epilepsy. You know, I have heard this so many times, Chan Chao So Ni, you know, and, and so on, and they go on and on, and I think it's true. You know, uh, neuro, uh, you know, they used to have very little epilepsy surgery in China. Now every year they do something like 3,000, 5,000 epilepsy surgery. Now they, uh, uh, neurologists interested in epilepsy, the membership is 8,000. They have the biggest uh, chapter in the whole world. Uh, you know, the whole world is probably 15,000 and half of them now in China. You know, this, this uh, so it, it, it can mean, uh, and, and I think, uh, we, I'm also happy that we actually contribute directly to the society. To the society, we are not just, uh, you know, ivory towers. So uh, I am worried. Uh, no, I mean I, you know, I think these are our values and the challenges. Uh, the first thing is I think we should put high priority on the training of neurologists. I gave two examples why it is important. You see, Singapore has 97 neurologists. Johor has two neurologists. It's crazy. And uh, Johor has 3.5 3 million people. And our friend uh, Lim Shi Hui, his city has uh, 6 million. And you look at Borneo. Borneo, Kalimantan Barat. If you look at the map, Kalimantan Barat has 19 neurologists. And uh, Sarawak has four. Sabah has two. It's crazy. Well, what are we proud, so proud? 
we think we, you know, it's actually we are very, very far behind. And there's no end of the tunnel. If you look at it the way we do, for another 20 years, it'll still be the same. Uh, so really, one needs to put very high uh, 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 priority. Uh, right now, the MOH, uh, you know, to get a seat of training is so long. You know, uh, I, I think really something needs to be done about it. And I take it that as a university, we should uh, also, as a Ministry of Health, uh, we should take it as a high priority. Unfortunately, as far as I know, it's not even in a KPI of the university staff to participate in this sort of training. Am I right? Uh, KPI for doing a master program in the internal medicine, but not in the training on neurologists. So the second thing I want to say is, we said we should maintain the research culture, and uh, I think it's important. And 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 I think Prof Lim just now mentioned about one of the reason why it is very important because uh, because not all the medicine are straightforward problems, and research is one of the ways that we train our young people how to think and analyze. Uh, you know, the 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 uh, the other things. Uh, maybe it's time to start the MD PhD program. Maybe we should start a one year program in uh, Master of Clinical Research. You know, uh, well, uh, you know now the hosp the university talking about use of land, and uh, personally, I would want to see the university giving high priority to translational research in the use of land rather than commercial. Of course, we need money, but, uh, but I, I like to see where the heart of the university is. Uh, Subspecialty development, uh, I think the PD Center is a good model. Uh, I want to give tribute to Prof. Lim and his team members uh, and, you know, getting the donors and so on. So uh, I also remember what he told me about, he was trained and spent two years in, in doing a fellowship in Toronto. And the Toronto University has, the, the, the center actually have a fellowship program to train people like him and to come back and make an impact here. And, and I think perhaps we can do the same. And, and the, the other thing is important is to maintain a global outlook and global mission. And, uh, you know, I, I give two reasons, uh, sort of. One is that we have benefited from internationalized, uh, internationalism in the arena of medicine and science. The, the knowledge is put in, it, that we read every day, they actually are work done by other people, uh, you know, char not charging us. And then and with the globalization, you know, we, we actually benefited from everybody. And so it's, it's, our, it, it's natural that we should contribute back. But more important than that, I want to quote the what is written here about years and uh, and 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 uh, Harvard talking on Yale University webpage where Yale president states our goal is to become a truly global university, educating leaders and advancing the frontiers of knowledge, not simply for U.S. but for the entire world. And then uh, quoting uh, uh, Harvard uh, pre president. We are an American university, but we have a global reach and responsibility. You know, I think these universities are great. And one of the reasons they are great, my interpretation is that they are global outlook and mission. So because they have set their standards so high, 
That's why they remain great. That's my view. And uh, so if we set our standard in a kampong, we'll also achieve a kampong standard. So uh, thank you. Thank you the, to the university for allowing me to work here, give me freedom and trust, and colleagues, my colleagues in the neurology for the joy of working. And John and of course, and Prof Lim uh, today, uh, uh, coming all the way to, to, for this occasion, and my wife, my children, my family members uh, for their support and love all these years. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Siti Tan. Now we would like to invite with great honour again our Dean, Professor Adiba, for a special announcement. Thank you once again, Ahui. Before I proceed with a special announcement, I have another announcement to make. Perhaps uh, to respond to Prof Tan and to some extent to Prof Lim. Um, we are trying our very best to do all those things that uh, you, you've mentioned. In fact, this morning, uh, Chris Boy and I just came back from a pretty intensive two hours uh, trying to put together a cabinet paper um, uh, for, this, for the next cabinet meeting, I think. Uh, where we are asking not only for our teaching hospital, teaching hospitals, which have this uh, ambiguous status of being a public hospital, not uh, a government hospital, not government hospital, and perhaps being pushed to accept being under ACTA 586, which is a private hospital. So that's one thing we're um, trying to correct. The second thing we're, we're asking for is... Um, for the government to allocate uh, posts for training positions for DU53 um, uh, to, so that we can train in addition to the thousand uh, doctors from Ministry of Health that get distributed to all the teaching hospitals um, around the country each year to undergo the master's program, which is the first step before going to become neurologists, etc. We're asking the government to also... Um, allocate another to double that uh, because we're so far behind in the number of specialists in the country and we plod along the way we do, we'll never get to, I think, uh, 30,000 primary care physicians that we need, family care, family care specialists that we need in this country. And this will go hand in hand with uh, the third thing that we're asking the government to do is to, um, to approve the uh, formation of one national training program that we're working towards through the uh, national curriculum that, that many in this room are familiar with. Um, this has been kind of provisionally approved uh, in a special task force meeting that was chaired by the Deputy Prime Minister last week. So we're working oh, a week and a half ago. So um, the, the, the Dean's Council, Medical Dean's Council met with um, the Deputy Prime Minister to lament all these things that we, we're facing. So um, the new national, well, the national curriculum that, um, that uh, Lam Chi Lung and Sharul and for internal medicine and, and I can see Lydia working for rehab medicine uh, are working very, very hard uh, on. Uh, Prof Lim, I'm happy to say that we're... Uh, moving from the see one, do one, teach one uh, way of training specialists to all those, uh, all those important attributes and competency-based um, training that, that is so essential in postgraduate medical education these days. In fact, um, the uh, knowledge, skills and the levels that you describe uh, are exactly what we are putting in the, um, in the syllabus and in the assessment framework that, that everyone's working hard towards. We're having a special module on professional skills and values that hopefully all the 23 plus uh, specialties in the country will adopt. So um, there are many things that's happening. And, and of course, the globalization is very, very important to me. Last two weeks ago, we signed a, um, 
a memorandum of understanding with Merck Foundation to train um, African and, and Asian doctors to come uh, because it's Merck and they make oncology drugs and infertility and um, what's the other one? Oh, that's not good. Don't tell Merck. I forgot what else they did. What else they do? Um, oncology, fertility, infertility, and or oh, whatever. But anyway, we, we've we've agreed to. Uh, th so they're going to support one to two year fellowships um, to come to UM to do that. And uh, I think we've been invited by the government of Maldives to also expand our training program. So there's a lot of things happening. Um, and Prof Tan, I know you've you've inspired me in, in many of of that work. Um, so that wasn't the special announcement I was going to make, but I was, uh, you know, I, I thought I should respond to, to the presentations this afternoon. The special announcement I'm going to make is also, um, I think we've managed to maintain our lead as uh, the leading medical school in the country, even if I say so myself, um, through having the likes of uh, Prof Siti Tan, Prof Wan Azman, uh, Prof Liam, uh, and others who have continue to stay, to remain um, at the university, at UM, to train the next generation of specialists as well as uh, continue to provide their service to the patients despite the lure of uh, private practice uh, out there. I'm sure they get approached all the time to leave for private practice, but thankfully have uh, decided to remain with us and to, uh, to train and teach uh, the next generation of uh, specialists. And I felt um, that we uh, at the university often don't recognize and um, and uh, well don't recognize and appreciate uh, many of uh, our colleagues who uh, choose to do this. And and so last year, upon hearing that um, one of those icons of uh, UM, Prof. Datin Chia Yuk Chin was um, was retiring. Um, and uh, Department of Primary Care Medicine was having a, a special 30th anniversary and, and uh, commemoration of Prof Chia's contribution. I had this brainwave while I was at the airport in Singapore or somewhere, and I thought, who better to have a Lifetime Achievement Award than uh, to name it after uh, um, Yang Yang Ahmad Berbahagia Topuan Dato. Dr. Aisha Ong, who herself uh, is uh, really an iconic um, individual in, in Malaysia. She's a doctor, um, but also spent many years as our uh, as a chair of uh, UMMC, and and uh, you know provided uh, great leadership at UMMC in her in her time as chair of the hospital. But of course now she's also a pro chancellor of the university, and she very very graciously. I mean, it's it's not. Um, I think I broke all protocols by just WhatsApping our <laughs> pro chancellor and said, "Topan, you know, can I name uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award after you?" And she immediately said yes. And she said, um, "Would you like some financial contribution to this as well?" And I said, "Of course." <laughs> you, know, I, you know. So um, unfortunately, uh, Prof Tan Topan sends her regrets that she's not able to be with you today. But um, I very proudly like to announce that the second um, recipient of the Tokpan Dato Dr. Aisha Ong Award for Lifetime Achievement at the um, Faculty of Medicine University of Malaya is Professor Dato Tan Chong. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor uh, Adiba. Now, now the neurology unit 
and the Department of Medicine would also like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude and our appreciation to Professor Dr. Tan Chong Ting. Now, it's not an easy task to choose a, an appreciation gift to someone who has contributed so immensely to the unit, to the department, and to our lives. Um, so after much literature review, uh, research, and of course grant application <laughs> and fund solicitation, we have decided on this gift. Um, And Prof Tan, we really hope you like it. We chose this because we know you have an appreciation for Chinese literature. So this is a royal Selangor plaque with a Chinese poem that describes the virtues of a gentleman through the four plants that are commonly quoted in Chinese literature. So let me invite my colleagues to read out the Chinese poem and translate it into English for you. So the name of the poem in Chinese is called Jun Zi Song or English an Odi to a gentleman. Han Mei Ao Gu Ling Feng Ban Bo Hua Ying Wu Fei Shuang Ting Ba Li Yan Qian. The first picture is Ban Mo Sum which carries a significant meaning of conquering peace with a defying spirit. The mortal shadow dance with the sleep while standing tall on the rocks. Second line, Yu Lan Qian Hua Jing Su, Ruo Wu Fang Xiang Man Shen Gu, Gao Jie Ran Wu Cheng. This carries the second flower is orchid, which carries the meaning of leading with simplicity. The fragrance diffuses into the valley like a fog, always noble and pristine. Um, <coughs> this is followed by the third line. Lang Zhu, Xu Huai Gang Yi, Feng Yu Piao Yao Bi Yi Liang, Chen Yun Qi Zi Hua. So it translates to upholding a virtuous fortitude, yet able to bend with the storm for advantage, rooted deep in age old strength. <laughs> Alright, this should be interesting. Qing <laughs> Ji, Jing Xin Ming Ji. Ching Kong Yun, Miao Ying, Hu Jing, Ya Yi, Jing Yu Ren. <laughs> okay. So the, the fourth line is uh, sense for the chrysanthemum, which is uh, representing keeping purity of heart and clarity of mind, like a lake reflecting a cloudless sky, elegant yet carefree. Such are the depictions of a gentleman, noble virtues that transcend through the lifetime with effects lasting and eternity. For you, Prof. Dato Tan Chong Ping. Now, we would like to invite Professor Sanjeev Mahadeva, the Head of Department of Medicine, Professor Go Kianjing, Head of Neurology Unit, Madam Lechami, our Head of MLTs, uh, together with the specialists and consultants of the Neurology Unit of University of Malaya. Please come and join us at the stage. We would like to invite Professor Datuk Tan Chong Ting to receive this special gift from all of us.
please please stay on stage uh, as we would also like to now invite the Dean, Professor Adiba, our Deputy Deans, Professor Yvonne and Professor Chris Boy, our invited speakers, Professor Lim Shi Hui and Professor John Dan, Datin Tan Chong Tin, uh, and also all our senior and leading members from the Neuroscience Fraternity. Please, please come and join us uh, with uh, this photo session. Professor Wong, come Tong. Um, now we would like to invite all our neural lab technicians uh, to please come out on the stage for a group photo as well with Professor Tan. All of you are also cordially invited to tea. Just one floor up. Everyone is invited. Just in case you're thinking maybe medical students don't get a free tea. <laughs> Thank you very much again for coming to join us at this Fresh Fish Symposium. See you at tea upstairs. <laughs>